All right. Um, I would like us to maybe start in a few minutes. I'm sorry for the slight delay. I know I'll start by thanking our esteemed deans for honoring this invitation to talk to our university community about leadership at its finest. And I'm very thankful to all of them. I see Dean Perry is on, Dean Tracy Shannon, Dean Olga Glotova, and we just giving a few minutes for Dean Alexander to join, and then we start. But before we even start, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Jackson from the provost office, because the office of the provost is one of the greatest supporters of the interdisciplinary seminar series. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Yvette Sunga the current chair of the Tuskegee University Faculty Senate, who um, is also a supporter of this event. And I thank them while we're waiting for Dr. Alexander, I would like to um, just welcome everybody in attendance and also thank the sponsors of the University Interdisciplinary Seminar Series for their unrelenting support for the activities that we do at Tuskegee. Amongst the supporters or the sponsors of this project, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Tuskegee University Office of the Provost, the of Student Engagement Initiative and University-wide Honors Program, the National Park Services, the University Faculty Senate, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Agriculture, Environment and Nutrition Sciences, the departments of the Department of, Language, uh, of Languages, Modern Languages, Communication and Philosophy. And I would like to thank our various deans and heads of departments who also support this event and who have tuned in in their numbers. I am not forgetting our students and the Tuskegee community for joining this event. And as you know, the event is titled to highlight the marvelous works done by our female deans at Tuskegee. And I would dare say this was born, this conversation we are having today was born of the fact that in my classes and talking to students at Tuskegee University, they simply did not know about the iconic deans that we have at Tuskegee as women. On top of that, we are celebrating Women's History Month. What a way to pay tribute to our iconic deans. I know, I say this, it is, we live in a world erroneously or intentionally called a man's world, but I have often asked myself questions. What would the world be without women? And I transpose that question in this forum to asking what would Tuskegee be without our iconic deans. So having said this, before I bring our deans 
on the platform, I would like to do just a little housekeeping. If you are on the call, keep yourself at all times. And if you have a question, send it. Um, there will be room for Q&A and you would be called on to raise your hands and ask those questions. Before the deans come to the floor, Dr. Jackson, I would like you to say a word from the office of the provost. And after you, Dr. Esunga, could you say a word from the office of the provost? That will be wonderful. Dr. Indy, and, and thank you also for the opportunity to, to just bring greetings. And, and um, I want to just begin my very brief comments by saying how wonderful it is when we deliberately and intentionally celebrate and appreciate the, the work of, of those who help to build, continue to build Mother Tuskegee. This is Women's History Month. And so I challenge everyone here to thank the women in your lives for the work that they are doing and for the love that they share. Um, we, we just applaud this initiative, Dr. Dr. Indy. And my hope is that this will become an annual event because our women deans that we have at Tuskegee University truly are trailblazing ladies of distinction, each in their own, each in their own right. And I, I look at, at, at Dr. Perry, who is one of the first board certified veterinary radiologists in the world. And she's here at Tuskegee. She's here at Tuskegee. Dr. Tracy Shannon, a wonderful, wonderful woman of faith, a woman of health and healing here at Tuskegee. Dr. Olga Glotova is a wonderful woman of stature who truly is, is doing as much as she can with the work that she can in leading and building the School of Education. Dr. Olga Bowden Tiller. We know Dr. Bowden Tiller to be this true force of nature. Why is that? Because she truly is the wind, the wind that helps to build and guide a lot of the work that we are doing here. So I thank you for honoring these iconic women deans. And I challenge us to continue to honor each one for the work that is that it has been done and the work that is yet to be done. So thank you, Dr. Inthe, for the opportunity to just express my appreciation on behalf of the board of the, the office of the provost. And each of us is CEO of self and we are our own advisory board. So we lead, we guide, and we develop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson, for those heartwarming remarks. And I make a public pledge. This is the first of the series, but it will not be the last. So this will be an annual event. And in between, I will have the deans individually address our community because most of our students come to Tuskegee, they live without knowing, without knowing the people who make and shape their future. They have world-class educators, but they don't seem to know who is who and I hope through this, it will be a way to educate our students and even some on the faculty who do not fully appreciate some of the work our women deans do. Thank you very much. And now Dr. Esunga, bring us the word from the 
faculty senate. Good evening. Greetings from the faculty senate. Thank you, Tuskegee. Thank you, Dr. D, for this wonderful forum to give thanks to the women community in the world at Tuskegee. Thank you so much. I would like to, of course, thank Dr. Jackson, the Office of the Provost. I would like to thank our deans. Everyone knows how uh, elated, happy we are at the Senate whenever we see them uh, because we know how busy they are. And we are happy when we see them because it shows that they care about faculty issues. Uh, and whenever we see them, we, uh, we like to, to recognize the, the presence to, and everything that they bring to us. So I want again to, to thank Dr. Perry. I want to thank Dr. Glotova. I want, I want to thank Dr. Shannon, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Uh, Bolden Tira. We thank you ladies so, so much for, for making us look good. Um, because when, when, when we see you, we, um, we, it makes us, it just makes us feel like, you know, we are seen. So, so thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to say that in my culture, we are only as good as we are together. And so, yes, we are celebrating the women here at Tuskegee, but the women will be nothing without their men. And so we also want to thank the men who make the women in this world great. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. D. Thank you, thank you. So this is what I would request. I would like that our deans on the call, uh, they will take turns in this order because I have a few questions for them. The order I'm requesting is not hierarchical because as we know, all of the deans are important in their own right. It is just for us to keep the conversation orderly. So we would have for every question or reflection I would want our deans to address. We would like Dr. Perry to go first, Dr. Glotover, Dr. Shannon, Dr. Alexander, and Dr. Bolden Tiller, if they are all on the call. So the first point, our starting point would be that Dear deans, respectable deans, I would just like you to tell our viewers on the call in about three minutes who you are, tell us about your inspiration, your journey on the path you have chosen and what you do in your leadership role because most people might just hear Dean. They don't know the role a Dean plays in their lives. So Dr. Perry, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Indy. And, and I want to say congratulations and celebration to my uh, women colleagues and those women in leadership roles and those women who are just supporters uh, in their own homes, uh, in their profession as well. And so I am uh, the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine and I've served in this role since 2014. And as Fay Hall, Dr. Fay Hall Jackson already acknowledged that I am a board certified veterinary radiologist by training and the first African-American female to be privileged with this honor following in the footsteps of my mentor, Dr. Ellis Madison Hall who was the first African-American male board certified veterinary radiologist. And just knowing the last name of Hall should be thinking of a connection, who is Dr. Faye Hall Jackson's father, who also was a Tuskegee grad. He was my inspirational role model 
And he continuously reminded me of my purpose as an educator, a leader, and my gift to give back in stewardship. So both of us are graduates of Tuskegee University. I completed my radiology residency training at Michigan State University and returned to Tuskegee University in a radiology faculty position for eight years and was recruited back to Michigan State for over 20 years and then on faculty and then was recruited back to Tuskegee in 2007 as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. I stayed in that role for seven years and now I'm in the current role as Dean. Along the way, I remember a call from Dr. Hall when I was at Michigan State to come back in 07 and he said, it's time for you to come home. And uh, I said, well, not yet. And he said, it's time for you to come home. And that is the, 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 the rest of the story is I decided to come home and home was back to Tuskegee. My leadership role, Dr. Indy, is no different than uh, my Dean colleagues, which is to provide a vision for the college that engages faculty, staff, students, alumni, and other stakeholders in accomplishing the goals, provide a strategic plan aligned with the university, and serve as a roadmap for the college to follow to achieve its mission. Also to empower and engage faculty, staff, and students in the leadership of the college. As deans, we're just not doing it ourselves. Uh, so it has to be a team approach and provide opportunities for faculty, staff, and students to advance scholarly and be leaders in the veterinary and public health professions. And I did that in less than three minutes. Oh. Thank you very, very, very much. So let's go on to the next Dean. Dr. Glotova, you take it away now. <laughs> Dr. Andy, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from the School of Education. Um, greetings to my fellow um, deans, female deans at Tuskegee University, university administrators, uh, faculty, uh, staff, and students. I am Olga Glotova, uh, Interim Associate Dean in the School of Education. I'm also uh, Assistant Associate Professor and Department Head for Physical Education. Physical Education is my area of expertise. I was trained um, many years ago back in my home country. And basically, you can guess my uh, accent where I'm from. Uh, I was born and grew up in a country that does not exist anymore. It was Soviet Union. Nowadays, it's Russian Federation. I came to United States 25 years ago with my family to pursue graduate studies in kinesiology, physical education. It took me some years to improve my English skills. English is my second language. And then I studied sport management at University of Connecticut, and then moved to Alabama in 2007, again with my family, to become a PhD student at Auburn University. So I spent uh, time in different states, learned from different people, learned from different faculty, at two different very good, very strong universities. And finally, in 2013, I came on board as young junior assistant professor in physical education at Tuskegee University. Two years later, uh, our dean who recently retired, Dr. Carlton Morris, recommended me as interim department head for physical education. So now I serve in this capacity for nine years. Upon his uh, retirement, Dr. Morris again nominated me, recommended me to become um, a leader of this academic um, unit at Tuskegee University. And this is just my second year serving in my capacity as an interim associate dean in the School of Education. I have to tell you the truth. It is a very challenging job. It is extremely challenging job where you have to spend time working with faculty, staff, students. 
stakeholders, community representatives, local public schools, uh, local state representatives. And currently we're working on our accreditation, which is national accreditation. Uh, a lot of responsibilities, a lot of communication uh, skills uh, required for this type of job. Uh, as a new leader, as a young leader, uh, I embrace my leadership with both as a responsibility, but also as a privilege. And I would like to thank university administration, higher administration, provost office, and president's office to trust and believe in me. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Glotova, for those inspiring words. And let's move on to Dr. Tracy Ch Shannon. You have the floor, Dr. Tracy Ch Shannon. Good evening, everyone. It, I consider it a, an honor and a pleasure to be here um, this, this afternoon. Um, I am Dr. Tracy Shannon. I am the Interim Dean for the School of Nursing and Allied Health here at um, Tuskegee University. I um, served before I came to Tuskegee. I, I served for 27 years in the Alabama Community College system as um, faculty. And for the last five years during my tenure there, I served as the um, director for all health science programs. I came to Tuskegee in the fall of 2019, and I was hired as the associate dean for the School of Nursing and Allied Health. And when um, Dr. Hendricks uh, retired, left, I, I became the interim dean for the School of Nursing and Allied Health. I, I attended in undergraduate school, I attended the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, where I acquired a Bachelor of Science degree. And from there, I matriculated to Troy University in Montgomery, where I acquired a Master of Science degree in nursing. And um, after acquiring my master's degree in nursing, then I went back and I was the first of eight um, students to obtain the Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from Troy University in Montgomery. Nursing is not a job for me. It's a passion that I have. Um, from the time that I started, I graduated from the University of Alabama um, in 1986, May of 1986, and I have never regretted not one moment of being in the profession of nursing. Um, I worked in the acute care setting, which is the hospital setting. I worked in long-term care setting, but the longest term um, of my tenure has been in academia, um, the 27 years in the Alabama Community College system, and then the years that I have spent at, at Tuskegee University. Um, my passion is to um, inspire and to empower and be not just a, a leader, but a transformational leader. And I choose to do that as a servant leader also. I have a, a Master of Arts degree in Bible and Pastoral Theology. So um, I do believe that um, I am not any stronger than the weakest link. So um, as a leader, I try to um, transform others and inspire them to know who they are, know whose they are, and embrace who they were created to be, and then collectively we identify a vision and move forward so that um, everybody benefits, not just the leader and the follow, but the leaders and the followers as well. Um, I think that I can I condense that into less than three minutes, but okay. um, that is who I am. <laughs> Thank you very, very much um, for tracing us your journey. And um, you know what you do in your leadership position. That is great. And I think my students are listening and taking good notes. 
you would have to write the essays and we'll have to share them with our deans. Now we have Dean Delores Alexander. Please, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dolores Alexander. I am originally from Tuskegee, Alabama. So I was born literally on this campus. Uh, and so I'm a Tuskegeean in a whole bunch of ways. I was born in Tuskegee. My parents were both Tuskegee Institute graduates, so I'm legacy here. Um, I was educated in the Tuskegee, Alabama public school system. And I'm also a TU graduate. Um, I am currently serving as Dean of, uh, interim Dean of the Graduate School at Tuskegee, a position I've held since May 1st. I think I'm the newest Dean here. Um, but before that, I have 20 years of expertise working in graduate studies um, here at Tuskegee. So I did my undergraduate degree from um, Alabama State University in biology and chemistry. I, I earned a master's degree in environmental science from Tuskegee. And then I earned my PhD from Harry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, in biomedical research. Um, I did postdoctoral work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I was a fellow in the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, where I worked on infectious diseases and cancer. Um, and then I returned to Tuskegee uh, after also completing a postdoc in genetics um, in 2005, uh, principally to help start the Integrative Biosciences PhD program, which was Tuskegee's first PhD program in the life sciences. As a part of that program, I worked with three of the academic deans, um, Dr. Ruby Perry, who's also a mentor for me. Uh, I've watched her career and, and marveled by it. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Bolden Tiller, Olga Bolden Tiller, um, who's Dean of Ag and Environmental Sciences, um, and then uh, Ag Environment and Nutrition Sciences, and uh, Dean uh, uh, Prakash, who's the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences. So I've been here 20 years um, using my area of expertise, which is in microbial ecology and in uh, cancer and genetics. Um, why am I here? I'm here because I want to be. Uh, I'm not only a product of this community and this university, I'm a person who loves graduate education, been dedicated to it for longer than I've been at Tuskegee, more than 30 years I've been working in graduate education. And I thought that given my background and my experiences, I had something to offer. Uh, my mission is, is, my passion is student support. Uh, I am absolutely, absolutely an advocate for students. I believe that we should support them in a, in a sort of, um, um, well-rounded way, so not just academically, but also socially, emotionally, we should provide a place for them that builds their confidence uh, and it reminds them that they're not here by themselves, they're not here alone, and that they have an impact to make on this world. They're here with a purpose, that they matter. And so everything I've done in graduate studies is to not only prepare them academically and professionally, but also to prepare them for the things that they're going to have to deal with emotionally, spiritually, socially. Uh, the world as you all know, is not necessarily an inviting place. And there are lots of political and social mores that affect our community. I want our students, our graduates to be prepared, not just for their academic careers, but to make a social impact that's lasting and significant and positive. And that makes the Tuskegee name even more renowned than it always is. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. And I will call on those in the audience um, before I call on the, those in the audience, I don't seem to see Dr. Bolden Tiller. Maybe she's um, committed and could not make it, but we have to recognize her and students have to take cognizance of her presence on our campus as one of our deans. Students, I encourage you to get in contact with her and address some of these questions that our deans are giving us here so that you educate yourself on the very important and crucial role that she is playing in one of the biggest schools here. Now, I was asking everybody on the call to send their reactions, whether they're clapping or they're sending hearts, please do show you are ex express your reaction to our female deans on what they, you have just heard. It is just the beginning before I go to the next question. I want to see what you guys, I want to see your excitement.
Send us the hats. Send us the claps, please. Keep it coming. <laughs> Keep them coming. All right. Keep them coming. All right. Thank you guys very much. Let's. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Um, I will now move on to asking or giving the next prompt what our deans should tell us about. Our deans are deans of major schools or colleges at the university. And I was just wondering if they have major concerns that preoccupy them in their leadership position, in their scholarly and professional endeavors? What are these major concerns? And why is it important for us to know? So we will go just as we did the first round. Dr. Perry. Okay. Yes, and thank you again, Dr. Indy, and thank the audience for uh, the applause of encouragement. That was very nice. So we all know that very, major concerns vary depending on the environment of where we uh, live and where we work. But here at Tuskegee University, my major concern is not having the financial resources to to, and this is probably going to go across the other teams as well, is, is not having the financial resources to sustain the legacy mission of the college, to attract the best students into our programs and attract talented staff and expert faculty to deliver a quality educational experience for our students and prepare them as day one competent professionals. This is what really keeps me up uh, at night. Why is it important? I never want to be the one to get in the way or be an obstacle of seeing bright minds not given an opportunity to realize their career goal. I never want to be a barrier of making a difference in someone's life. And it actually creates more stress for me of not being a voice to those who need someone to speak on their behalf, especially for change. So that is that is the major uh, concern here is just not having the finances that that's that are needed. And we understand that Tuskegee is, is semi-private and and uh, we we depend heavily on on grants and fundraising externally externally. And we do the very best that we can. In spite of all of that, we do more. Actually, we do more with what we have. And we graduate some great leaders. And if I talk a moment about veterinary medicine and the leaders in the veterinary space uh, have achieved much because of their training and education at Tuskegee University. So we do a lot with a little, but it would be nice to have more so that we could do more. And so that is that is the major concern that I have for my college. Thank you very, very, very much. And Dr. Glotova. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andy, again. And thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Dr. Perry. Uh, this was very um, uh, good observation uh, for Tuskegee University. So for the School of Education, for the field of education, I would like to talk about um, three areas. Um, where um, I see some of the concerns uh, or some of the challenges. Uh, so first is um, academic excellence and student success. So these are my first priorities for uh, school of education and of course for the all students at Tuskegee University campus. So this involves continuous um, evaluating and enhancing our curriculum to meet the evolving needs of the field of education 
And of course, uh, we need to provide uh, all of our students with resources and support they need to excel academically, professionally, and personally. Uh, second uh, significant area is um, equity and diversity in the field of education and higher education. I believe it's very important, it's imperative that we promote uh, inclusivity and um, foster environment where all students feel valued and supported. I also would like to advocate uh, for the profession of education and promote the importance of education, public education in our society. We all know that without teachers, we would not have doctors, engineers, social workers. It all starts with your kindergarten teacher who actually installs all of the knowledges, skills, abilities in you when you're just five year old. Um, educators play a pivotal role in shaping the future. And it is very important, it's essential to highlight the significant work um, of educators and uh, provide them with recognition they deserve. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Shannon. Two things that I would say um, are my major concerns are um, I consider nursing to be a, a helping profession. And in order to be effective, um, first and foremost, you, you need to have a passion for it. And in society, um, sometimes the driving force is not um, a passion, but it is a desire for um, economic status. And in the in the healthcare profession today, um, I just like to share a personal testimony. Uh, when I graduated from the University of Alabama in 1986, um, I was thrilled to death and excited because um, the first year that I worked for 12 months, I made $50,000 for that year. Today, in the profession of nursing, nurses can work one week and make four to $5,000, 12 to $20,000 a month. Usually, as a traveling nurse, they make $300,000 or more annually. But the reason for nursing is to help and ensure that people are healthy and that they um, are able to leave an acute care facility and be able to be functional in life. So um, it, it's, it's a very serious um, profession. And um, what our goal is, is to make sure that students understand that um, they got to, they got to want to know the knowledge that it's going to take to be effective in the profession and it's not gonna be easy. Um, our students that um, matriculate from the pre-professional phase to the professional phase, um, they tell us that it's as different as night and day. And um, our students that matriculate from K through 12 to their freshman year, they describe that experience also as being as different as night and day. And it was not that drastic of a difference for me when I matriculated through K through 12 and then arrived at, 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 um, at the University of Alabama. But it's, it is also different now. So the challenges that I see are um, the, the challenges with regard to um, 
preparing the students once we receive them at the professional level and then making sure that they're not just ready, but more than ready for entry into practice. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alexander? Yeah, I can almost just say ditto. <laughs> uh, all the other deans have identified uh, some of the common challenges uh, that we have. Um, if I'm concerned about anything as graduate dean, it's the number of students who want to pursue careers in the academy uh, versus going um, out to make easy money. I was listening to Dr. Shannon and the fact that you can make $300,000 a year as a travel nurse, that's, a, that's, a, that's exciting for me. Maybe I need a second career. But um, well, we, we, a lot of our students you know, um, come from family where um, some of the things that we do at the graduate level are not understood. A lot of our students are still first-generation college students, and certainly the first people in their family to earn advanced degrees. So making sure we have a study pool of really talented, really excited, creative, uh, innovative people uh, to go into our graduate programs. Um, that's all, always a concern. It's something that we monitor uh, um, quite heavily. And we have a number of recruiting strategies that we're trying this year to increase the numbers. Um, we had uh, a, a certain uh, a decrease um, in applicants um, with COVID. I think most of our universities had the same uh, sort of COVID reaction. And now uh, that the pandemic is, um, is, is declining and that we've become more adept at dealing with um, COVID and other infectious diseases, we're looking to see our numbers uh, increase. We're hoping this year to double our enrollment of uh, first year students. Uh, and I think we're on track to do that. So that's our, that's not a concern in-house, it's just making sure there was a, a, a pool of talented students and that people are aware uh, that uh, careers uh, in, that, that involve advanced degrees are still out there and that we still need young people to serve those roles. There's still too many times when I'm in a meeting and I'm the only person who shares my cultural uh, perspective. I'm the only person who um, you know, uh, graduated from the schools I graduated from. And so by this time, I really thought that there would be more diversity. And so with that, that points to my concern um, as of late, my recent um, area of concern is all of these anti-diversity, uh, equity, inclusion bans, including the one that was just signed here in the state of Alabama, to limit the teaching of the things that make us diverse and unique. You know, the United States is a blend of people from all across uh, the world, and we have all kinds of cultures and races and ethnic groups here that should be celebrated, not banned. And so um, working with uh, the university and other universities to make sure diversity is still important uh, in the academy, that we still value inclusion, inclusion and that we still seek to be equitable in the way that we offer our programming. That's really um, um, a concern I have, especially with the recent political uh, challenges and, and uh, that we've seen in our court systems. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all deans. And your remark, Dr. Alexander, actually pushes me to ask the next question, which is with all what we are facing, the political um, gimmick, the, the, the abolition of the diversity and equ equality, it, one has to have a driving force and we have many young people on the call listening to you. Could you take a minute or two or even three minutes to tell them what your driving force is, knowing what you know today? And what will you tell your younger self? Because I know some of these things are not just things that popped up like mushroom today. It has been going on and on. So knowing what you know today, what is it you're going to tell these young people? What motivates you? What makes you wake up and still want to do what you have to do? And how could these young people gain inspiration from it? Thank you. Dr. Perry, you have the floor. <laughs> okay. so. 
I, every day, well, first of all, I enjoy coming to work every day. So I, I think when I stop enjoying that, it'll be time for, for me to retire. But I do want to retire before I get to that point. But I, I am truly inspired with uh, just engaging in innovative conversations with thought leaders. And each student is a thought leader, actually, because it's amazing what I've been able to glean when I talk to students in the college. And we work together or have these conversations about finding a more efficient or a proficient way of doing things. Because st students see areas that we don't see, or they may see something that we don't see. And there needs to be some avenue where they can share their ideas uh, with us as deans and leaders. How do we make things better? Well, I might not see what you see, or I might not feel the way that you feel about something, but you never know. I can get my, my mind can be changed, but it starts with those engaging conversations where you go, huh, I did think about that. Wow, let's let's try to do that better. I I I I the another driving force is I, I want to continually raise or lift the bar to achieve those, those uh, to meet those achievable milestones that make us better than the day before. So even when I come to work on Monday, I look at, well, what could I have done better on Friday? Uh, what is it that I can do in the following week to make things better? So what would I say to my younger self? I, I would say, stay on task. Uh, be clear on, on my purpose in life, that which is relevant to make a difference in my leadership space or any space that I'm involved in, in my bubble, a little bubble, big bubble, whatever it might be in my space. How can I make that area better than when I got to it? When I, when I came on board, this is where the lay of the land, how can I make that better? So that's what I would say to my younger self. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. And let's continue. Dr. Glotova, you take the floor. <laughs> very interesting question, Dr. Uh, Andy. What is your driving force? Driving force is you. It's always you. You begin with your day with you. So my... Uh, day begins uh, with a little workout. I'm a physical education major. Uh, in the past, I was professional athlete. I was a member of national track and field team. So working out is not an issue. It's not something that uh, I cannot achieve or I cannot overlook in my life. So my driving force starts very early in the morning with me exercising. And this is what I promote in young females, young students at Tuskegee University, and overall for Tuskegee students, for my colleagues, my neighbors, and my friends. So I encourage students, I encourage people around me to trust your ability. Everything is possible. Don't be afraid to try new things. If someone told me, 25 years ago that I would go to a different country, learn different language, graduate from graduate school, write my dissertation, uh, have my family here, children, start my career, professional career, somewhere else, not at home, not with my uh, mom and dad next to me, not with my friends from college working in the same school system with me, but a different country with different people, different language, different culture, different standards and expectations. I would not believe that person. But now I'm here. I'm at Tuskegee University. I'm in Alabama. Some people in my country uh, ask, where exactly is Alabama? And what do you do there? Yes, it's cultural shock, but everything is possible. If you decided to go overseas and start your career somewhere else as a travel nurse or scientist or engineer, learn the language, learn the culture. Don't be afraid uh, to learn new things, but also embrace your own 
authenticity because you are unique. You are who you are. Um, don't be afraid of challenges. And sometimes those challenges, barriers, setbacks, they are opportunity to grow and learn. None of us are perfect. We did mistakes and we learn from those mistakes. So surround yourself with very good mentors, people you trust, people who support you, who could, people who believe in you and believe in your potentials. So I was very lucky to have a lot of good mentors and I still do have mentors here in the University, in my neighborhood, in Auburn, where my family lives. And sometimes I reach out to uh, uh, good people to give me some, some wisdom. So don't be afraid of any of this. Authenticity, trust your ability, and try new things. Thank you very much for that insightful and inspirational talk. Let's hear from Dr. Alexander before we move on to the next question, which you have actually preempted, Dr. Glotova. Dr. Alexander, you have the floor. Um, so what drives me, I'm a person of faith. And so that's first. I believe that I'm here for a purpose, that God has a purpose for my life, and that this is part of it. The other thing that drives me is something I saw when I was a postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill. It was a quote uh, on the back of a truck uh, at the cancer center. And it said, no condition is, per is, is permanent. No condition is permanent. And, and so no matter how bad things seem, it's gonna get better. And if you're at the top of your game today, know that the day may come when you hit a valley, but no condition is, purpose. It, it's, it's permanent. Um, there's always hope. So my faith and the hope I have that I can help make things better and that things will indeed get better. Those things um, are what drive me. Um, what would I tell my younger self? I think to be bolder. I've always been um, a conservative person uh, in, in, you know, to some degree. And so I wish I had taken more time when I was younger uh, to be bolder, uh, to do some of the things um, that were exciting to me, but I kept thinking I'll have more time, I'll do it later. And now, you know, my schedule was super busy. I'm usually triple booked. And so it's very difficult for me to travel, except for professional reasons. It's very difficult for me uh, to, to go on vacation because I always have so many things to do. I'm learning better about mind and uh, work, uh, mind, body and work-life balance. So I'm doing better this year than I usually do. I'm actually taking some time for myself every month to do something I've always wanted to do. But I wish I had done things like that when I was younger. I had an opportunity to travel to Rome, but I was too busy working on my dissertation. I had an opportunity to go to Australia Australia, but I was getting ready to defend. I was getting, had an opportunity to go to China, but I had just started my job as a postdoc, right? So I wish I had taken uh, some of those um, opportunities and, and, and I try to be mindful of that now and do the things that I really, really want to do. Go ahead and do them now. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. That uh, sounds a very encouraging. It is a mentoring statement you have made. And as I said, Dr. Glotova and all of you preempted the next question, which I'll just ask you to take about a minute each and tell us about some of the exemplary women in history that have shaped your worldview or that you emulate in your area of professional practice. I want, I, sh I frame the question as, you know, talking about exemplary women. I'm not saying we should discard the men, but women have always been at the forefront of everything. Even if patriarchy decided to put them behind, today we want to put the women at the forefront. Please just give us, talk about some of the women that have shaped your world view. And, and Dr. Dr. Indy Allen, I'm referencing uh, the two women who have positively, positively impacted my life as mentors, advocates, and champions. The first one is Mrs. Patri Patricia Lowry, who's primarily responsible for my radiology journey from Tuskegee University to Michigan State University. 
And through the partnership pipeline program between the two universities, she was part of the visioning and took the lead with the impl implementation of the program. She ensured that we were surrounded by people who invested in our success as we enter veterinary internships and residencies. So she would check in on us. So when, when you know, many times when we have uh, people that say, I'll be there for you, but they're really not truly there. She was truly there to make sure that our uh, pro that we were successful in our program. So from 1975 to early 2000, she was instrumental in building a strong pipeline of African-Americans to achieve PhDs and become board certified veterinary specialists. The second woman is my mother who demonstrated that hard work and persistence are keys to a quality and healthy life. She and I being actively engaged in the civil rights movement in Mississippi, I often remember and I use daily are the pearls of wisdom she would say often, be the catalyst for change, be courageous to make a difference, be fair to people, do what is morally right, give more than you receive, and know that God would take care of you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Glotova, please. Uh, Dr. Perry, thank you very much for your inspiring words. Uh, you mentioned your mentor and you also mentioned your mother. And uh, that, that same second when you mentioned your mother, I started to think about my family. And I suddenly realized that I do not have a lot of female relatives. Almost all of my relatives are male. I don't have sisters. I do not have aunts. I do not have uh, female cousins. Almost all of my uh, relatives, except for my uh, two grandmothers and my mom. They are males. So I actually received a lot of influence from family members who are men. So when I went to school, I also had a lot of uh, mentor, uh, mentorship from my coaches, male coaches. And the first female who really um, inspired me uh, was a professor from uh, University of Connecticut, uh, Dr. Jennifer Bruning, who taught me how to do research. So everything that I achieved after I graduated from Yukon in the area of research is big thanks to my uh, professor in sports sociology. So she, ve she was very patient. She was extremely patient with me because I did not have any idea about research, research methods, statistics, qualitative uh, uh, statistics or quantitative statistics. She took time to, ta to teach me and... Um, she was um, very patient and gracious at the same time, extremely knowledgeable, and I achieved a lot because of her. Um, I also would like to mention um, a person who did a lot of um, research in education, a lot of work in education in general, and that's Maria Montessori. She was the founder of Montessori Methods uh, of Education and she actually uh, revolutionized the approach to early childhood education. So we study Marie Montessori methods with our students and we realize how important it is to put child in the center of learning environment, to provide individualized instructions and emphasize the learning environment and how this environment uh, affects student learning. So this whole concept uh, about uh, Marie Montessori uh, method helped me to become better educator and also better mother because I use the same approach uh, with my own children. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dr. Shannon. When I think about um, women who have influenced my life, um, I go back to um, elementary school. 
And, and I like to sometimes just call those names out. Um, I had one male teacher when I was in the first through the sixth grade, but um, otherwise I had um, female teachers and they were proud African-American women and they, they just, they made us feel like we were special and they made us identify our individuality and they treated us like we were all individuals so we were nurtured and that's what I remember most about my um, formative years of education is that we were mentored and we were um, cultured to identify who we were individually. They wanted us to grow up and be strong, independent women. And I received that when I when we got to high school. I can recall um, my 10th grade um, English teacher. Um, she made us stand up straight. She made us read. She made us write. And she made us orate. She said, you should be able to stand up. You should be able to look up. You should be able to speak up. And she said, that's going to be to keep the key to who you are and the impact that you're going to make in society. So the, 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 the women that impacted, that impacted me the most were actually my elementary school teachers. I remember them all individually. My junior high school teachers were exactly the same, and so were my high school teachers. And um, they would always, what I gleaned from all of that and what I teach my students even now is, whatever you aspire to be and what, whatever you have the courage to do, if it has been done by any one person, you know that it can be done. It may not have been done by thousands, but if it has been done by one person, then it can be done. And that they should never give up on what their goals are. They got to stay focused. And it, whatever you go through to get to that destiny is worth it. The good, the bad, and the indifferent because all three of those things actually make you who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alexander. I, there are too many names. There's just too many, too many women uh, from my church, from this campus, from my upbringing, my aunts and, and, and everybody. Uh, but I will mention three. The first one is my mom. Because if I don't mention her, I'm going to have trouble when I go home. Even though it's my house, she'll tell me I'm still the mama. I don't care what kind of dean or doctor you are. I'm still the mama. So my mother, who had her books from Tuskegee Institute School of Nursing all over our house, that fascinated me and, and intrigued me, seeing all those infectious diseases. And, and I always wondered, why did that person have that lesion, that sore, that disease? It, it, it fostered my love for science, uh, especially for the life sciences, biological sciences. And if I have a passion for science now, it's because of her. And then my Aunt Dorothy Alexander, she was the only girl, my dad's sister. She was the only girl in the family of 10 kids. And despite the fact that she had nine brothers who were really rough brothers, and she was born in the middle of the Mississippi Delta. So very poor, they were sharecroppers. She was, became the first person in our family um, to, to graduate from college. And not only did she earn her bachelor's degree and then a master's degree, she actually got her PhD from Ohio State, becoming the first person on any side of our family to earn an advanced degree. And so um, when, I, when I walk across the stage, I usually wear her PhD gown. She passed away seven years ago as Dean of the School of Education at Grambling State University, one of Tuskegee's sister schools. Uh, but she inspired that. And then locally, uh, a lady who may have been forgotten. Her name was Cora Fant. And Cora Fant um, worked at Tuskegee uh, when she died in 1959. She had worked at Tuskegee 
she was 59 years old and she had worked in Tuskegee for 43 years. She was sick. So she started working here at Tuskegee Institute when she was 16. Um, and she worked in the Office of Development. She helped start the United Negro College Fund. It was her uh, working with the president of our university to get that start, to get that started. So because of her work, um, thousands maybe tens of thousands of students have been able to afford college. Um, and she's buried in Greenwood Cemetery, which is a cemetery associated with Tuskegee University. We gave the land for that. And on her tomb is an epitaph that, that really speaks to me. It says, Cora Fant, and it has her, her, uh, her she was born in 1900, died in 1959. Uh, and it says, she, she have done what she could. And I, I've always liked that. She did what she could. That's what it says about her life. She did what she could. Uh, and so that inspired. What happened? Did we lose Dr. Alexander? All right, while hoping we get Dr. Alexander back in a minute. All right, for some reason, she might have had network issues. Dr. Alexander, are you back? All right, well, what we'll do, why don't we, while waiting, I'll, I'll just recognize a few people I've seen on the call that I did not recognize earlier. I see Dr. Rosso, just want to recognize you, Dr. Rosso. I see um, a good friend of ours who is a journalist with Sankofa Revolutionary Radio. Dr. Anthony Mohammed, just recognizing you. And um, I think we should have Dr. Alexander back on the call. Dr. Alexander, are you back? All right, if Dr. Alexander is not back, we will continue with the next question. We have a few more questions before we take the Q&A. And the next question, that I would like to ask, it should be like the one to the last question, is that are there any objectives or goals that you have set to achieve for yourself in your endeavor? Elaborate on how the challenges you have faced so far are going to influence these objectives. So we give the floor to Dr. Perry. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Indy. I feel some kind of way about always going first. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that that's because I'm a senior. <laughs> 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 well, I, um, I want to talk about a, a goal that I, I wanted to, that I set years ago. I don't have any really that I'm setting uh, now other than I'm, I want to work in, in the community, more in the community uh, when I retire. But when I, re when I returned to Tuskegee in 07 as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the college, I did not desire to become a Dean. And I'm saying that because we never know, our, our journeys are very convoluted. Uh, you might not feel it, but we did not, it's not in a straight line. And uh, so we, we do take those detours. But anyway, I did not desire to become a dean, but it was an opportun another opportunity to serve the university in a different uh, capacity. When I served as acting president for that semester, when the pandemic hit, I didn't desire that either, but it was a calling that I, I felt like I had to fulfill. And it was, it was an enjoyable experience, a learning experience and another opportunity again to serve the university. 
But seeing that I really enjoyed the associate dean role and realized that I had to create and implement programs that needed measurable outcomes. And that area of my educational journey was very lacking, but I knew I needed that. So I'm always up for a challenge. So I decided to pursue a PhD in educational leadership from Kaiser University that's headquartered in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I did not realize how extremely helpful this experience was for me in the social sciences and writing outcome reports during my deanship. And so every time I would have to write a report, I just say, oh my gosh, thank you for that experience. But the barriers that I faced while I was in that program that I had to overcome included I, I didn't get released from my regular duties and responsibilities in that position as associate dean. Two, I did not receive any financial support. So I said, I'm going to make this happen. I, I'll get some support somehow, somewhere. I did. And the chair of my graduate committee was not, and I put that in all caps, not the most supportive of my success. And you're going to come across these kind of people. And that's why you have to find these advocates or people, uh, champions, when someone says no, and you, you really feel that this is what you want to do, you have to find people to help you or champion uh, for you, for your success. So those experiences and barriers that I overcame helped me to be more supportive of the doctoral students whom we are educating and training to be experts in their disciplines, be the face of the ever-changing world and meet societal needs. And I mentioned having this conversation with Dr. Alexander and I said, you know, I now I can get a better feel and a better understanding of PhD students because I had to go through that myself. And many of those barriers are not necessary. They're not needed. We're there to support uh, students and make sure that they are, they realize their uh, career goal. Whatever we can do to support them now, obviously they have to do their part. But we need we it, it's it's I realize that we could be more supportive and uh, making sure that they are successful. Thank you. Thank you very very much, Dr. Glotover. Uh, goals and objectives. Um, so I do have one maybe ambitious goal. And I would like to cultivate future leaders and education. And not just in education, in physical education. So I really want to nurture the next generation of physical educators, leaders who are equipped with uh, knowledge, skills, um, abilities, and values to affect positively on changes in our generation, next generation of learners in our communities. I always have very good conversation, very interesting conversation with our physical education major students. I ask them, why do you want to become a physical education teacher? A lot of them said, I want to coach and degree in physical education will let me coach. So this is not just one side of this uh, profession. Coaching is great. It's very interesting. And we love our competition. We love our athletics. But we first need to um, develop educators. And then they can become a great coaches. So educators, look at our current um, situation with overweight and obesity rates. That's another great topic uh, we discuss with our students. You as an educator, physical educator, can truly help those kids who start to uh, struggle with those health issues. It doesn't start in high school. Unfortunately, it's too late. It starts in elementary school. Sometimes it's even start in preschool. So as an educator, you can provide knowledge. You can be a leader in, in, in this um, situation to give student opportunity to exercise, eat healthy, maintain healthy lifestyle. So you're not a physical, you're not a PE teacher, you are educator. So that is my main message to our students, our uh, future 
teachers, our future leaders in education. Of course, it um, has a lot of challenges. It involves uh, providing mentorship, personal experience, share personal experience and personal beliefs, uh, provide uh, professional opportunities, uh, professional development opportunities for students to go to different conferences, networking, uh, meeting with different people from different uh, areas, areas that also support health, physical education, fitness, and recreation. And of course, we need to train our future leaders to become educators, and then maybe administrators, and maybe athletic trainers, coaches, and I don't know, maybe someone in our program will be a great NFL coach in the future. It happens. Thank you. It happens. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Shannon, let's hear from you. While praying, Dr. Alexander can rejoin us. Well, one of my um, one of my major objectives is always um, set the example. So, um, one of the things that I like to do is to um, the re one of the reasons that I have I started with the BS degree, matriculated to the master's degree, and then to the terminal degree was because I wanted to not just say that it could be done, but just be a living testimony that it could be done. So um, the objective that I, I, I deal with on a daily basis is to, um, to, to reach the students and to um, show them the, uh, the opportunities that they have and then help them to identify how unique they are again individually and help them to try to realize what their what their divine purpose is and then help them to identify a path by which they can get there. Um, and they can get there by several different paths. Some may be longer than others, but um, I, I just like being able to work with students and help them to identify where their passions are and be able to help them to um, chart out a path by which they can, they can reach their goals. Okay, thank you very much. And this, this last question, I will, there are two questions in one, and I would just like to hear from you. With the recent spate, of attacks on DEI, we know very well that our society cannot function with one branch, said without the women or without the men. I would like you, my esteemed dear deans, to give a word to young men and young women, young men and men who are watching you here on how men could get involved in the advocacy for gender equality and equity. That's the first part. And the last part of the question is, we learn from the scriptures. The Bible tells us that iron sharpens iron. I look at all of you, I place you in that place where you actually engage with each other professionally to sharpen each other. Could you tell us how you engage with each other to sharpen other? So the first question, how can young, young men and men advocate for gender equality and equity? And how do you engage with each other as deans professionally to, to, to sharpen each other or to motivate each other? Thank you. And so Dr. Indy and my, and my uh, colleagues and students, for all of us, we can start with a meaningful and honest conversation. We all uh, can observe 
if you even if you see someone being treated differently or you see the in inequity or the inequality, why not stop and have a conversation? Be willing to listen with actions in mind. So if you if you if you if you really want to help, you're gonna listen with some kind of action in mind, not just just hear what the people are saying, but some kind of action. People cannot advocate for me if they do not know what I need or the barriers that I am facing. So again, when I was at Michigan State, there were all kinds of barriers and uh, hurdles put in my it put in my journey on purpose. But I was able to go to those advocates and champions to sh share. So there's a, 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 a level of honesty and trust to be able to do that. When I became dean, the first priority for me was to look at salaries of men and women. I knew that already. I knew that it was different. And it was uh, an obvious gender imbalance in when it comes to salaries. So my first goal was to find ways to make those salaries gen gender equal based on level of training and scholarly achievements. But first, I had to recognize that. So be knowledgeable, got to recognize that that could be the case, then research it and, make, and see if, that, if it is, and then be willing to do something about it. So be willing and courageous to ensure that all people are heard and treated fairly. If you're in a position of influence or power as the students leave and they graduate, and for us in our own positions, just ask a question, perform an investigation to see where the, the inequities and the inequalities are located. And then you engage in conversations and prepare for the necessary changes needed to have a more inclusive workplace environment. As you reach a level of power and influence, be willing to or not be not only willing, but should make that path better for others to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Glotova? <laughs> um, what advice or um, what words of wisdom uh, I can provide for uh, a young man? Uh, first, I would like to say, educate yourself. So take that, take time to educate yourself about gender issues, inequality, including social, emotional, cultural factors that contribute to those inequalities. Um, seek out a uh, response, advice from a professional, uh, experienced woman. You will be surprised how knowledgeable and experienced and wise they are. Um, challenge some gender stereotypes. So be mindful about the language that you use and assumptions that you make about uh, gender. Um, also, speak up. We always encourage young females, young women to speak up. Young male can do the same. If you see some inappropriate behavioral, sexism, inappropriate language, don't just stay there and be silent, speak up, call that inappropriate uh, behavioral, do something about this. If it happens in your personal life, if it happens in your workplace, if it happens in the society, please speak up. We need your help. We need your strength. Um, the second part of your uh, question, Dr. Andy, was how we relay on each other, how we sharpen each other. So I always look up to Dr. Perry. Anywhere we have our meetings, anywhere we meet, I always uh, sit and listen first what Dr. Perry is going to say. So um, I always um, try to see what my fellow uh, colleagues, uh, senior deans, people with uh, uh, years of experience teaching, doing research, what they say about specific issues, topics, how they provide comments, how they actually communicate. So I learn from the best. Um, 
Dr. Shannon, uh, she is very gentle. She is a true health profession uh, uh, person. She always speaks her mind. And at the same time, she always tries to, to make sure that all people are included in conversation. No one is left behind. So this is another example that I would like to mention. So I always, always appreciate any comments, help, um, um, support from my fellow female deans. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Dr. Shannon. I'll start by saying that um, you have to dare to be different. When you're in a setting and you see that um, there is some inequities um, happening, um, you, you can't just, or you, you can, but you should not just go along to get along. Um, there are unique ways in which we, um, in a lot of settings, would have to address those issues. So uh, wisdom is important. Timing is important because um, one of the things that we would not want to do is to cause more confusion than already exists. But um, when you when you react um, based on what you feel in your heart and you have allowed that to be analyzed in your head, um, then usually it's there it's a positive outcome. So um, my words of wisdom would be um, dare to be different and you can't be afraid, put yourself in that person's shoes and um, ask yourself, how would you feel if that was said to you, said about you, done to you? And um, be reactive, but um, you got to be wise when you do that because each situation is gonna be uniquely different. Um, and the second part of the question, um, how do we um, interact with each other so that iron sharpens iron? Um, I, I would have to say the same thing. The, um, the, the times that we are together in the um, Provost Leadership Council, um, I have learned something from every dean that's a part of that council. And I too, um, the, um, Dr. Latova, I, I tend to lean towards Dr. Perry and I listen carefully to what she says, how she says it. And I look at her nonverbal communication as well. Um, and I think that um, there's a purpose for all of that because she's been where I have to go. And um, I have really thoroughly enjoyed the time that, I've, that I have um, had to interact with you too, Dr. Glatoba, because um, you carefully choose your words and you speak with wisdom as well. So I think um, as colleagues, we just, um, it was it was preordained and purpose that we would all be here at this time for this time and for a specific purpose. And I think that's all divine. And um, I could say the same thing about, um, I had a really good conversation the first time I, I met Dr. Indy. I say the same thing about um, Dr. Faye Hall Jackson and Dr. Dr. Russell. The interactions that I've had with with um, all of my colleagues have been um, have been good interactions, and I have learned something from it. So my words of wisdom is dare to be different, be a have a positive impact on people and the things around you, and that's what's going to make life better, and it's going to make make the biggest difference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And I will just, I hope 
you don't mind us taking a few questions because this conversation has been riveting. If anybody listening and watching you as you have el elucidated in an amazing way your leadership role and everything. If they say they don't have comments or questions to make, then I will be flabbergasted. I will need some comments. And I just want to appeal, if you want to comment or ask a question, raise your hand, turn on your camera. If I called on to you, you address our esteemed deans, please. You have the floor. We will take a few comments, a few questions and answers. All right. I see a hand raised by Mr. Maxwell Swain. Do you want to turn on your camera and take the floor? Hello, I'm Maxwell Sane. I'm a junior animal science major. And my question was for Dean Perry. Um, what are some pressing gender inequalities that you currently observe within your respective role as Dean? And are there any proactive steps that you had in mind to um, address or mitigate uh, these disparities in the academic and as well as the professional uh, sphere? Well, thank you, Maxwell, for that that question. Along the my journey of over forty something years in the veterinary space, it, it is predominantly male. Now it's more female, but the males uh, dominate those leadership roles. They're the ones that make the decision. Now it's changing over years. Now you can't imagine when I graduated in seventy seven, uh, going into a male dominated veterinary profession. Uh, so if I'm if I'm in a space and I have a person who is non-color who might be uh, a worker, then they look at that person as the expert and I'm the one that's doing the cleaning. So but I was prepared for those kinds of experiences, Maxwell, when I was going through uh, civil rights. Uh, what to expect when you go into these different spaces? what to expect, how to react without being reactionary and put you in a place where you end up in jail someplace. So there's a way that you approach that. And if you're in spaces where you can make a difference, that's when you, and you're influential, that's, what, that's when you can make a difference. Some of my students uh, share, and I haven't had this experience, but some of my students share with me that, um, when they go on a farm, for example, and the farmer, of course, you get this a veterinary student, um, actually do not want the student of color doing anything with their animal, with their pet. And so it's up to the, the veterinarian or the instructor to say, if this student cannot get engaged, then we are, we are, we do not, we would not provide the veterinary service. That's when you are advocates for what you believe in that is right. That's all part of, part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. In the veterinary profession, we are one of the least diverse. We're getting better. And so when I served as co-chair of the commission, AVMA, AAVMC, on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the veterinary profession, there was some times when I had to speak and be courageous about saying, no, this is not how we, this is not, that this is not right. And this is not what I stand for. And so we were able to get a chief diversity officer for the AVMA based on those really tough conversations. When I went to Michigan State in my first year, Maxwell, there was a faculty member, I was holding a pet and the faculty member actually took my hand and, re and moved it from the uh, animal, the pet that was on the x-ray table and said to me, you don't belong here. And I took, if when you're patient, again, you had to, you're taught not how not to react, but to say, I'll show you. I can show you better than I can tell you. 
And so I continued, but they, they all wanted me to, well, not all, many of them wanted me to fail. But Mrs. Lowry said, oh, you would not fail. You would not fail. And students need to hear those kinds of stories that we all, many of us have come through. They've been difficult, but we're setting that journey for you all to continue speaking up and, 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 and speaking and have a voice for those who don't have a voice. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Perry, for that um, clear and concise answer. I, I will just call the names. Dr. Salau, I saw your hand. After that, I'll give the room to Morgan. Um, <coughs> so Dr. Salau, you have the floor. Um, Dr. Perry, uh, my question is directed uh, to Dean Perry. Uh, I know what she's talking about, and I'm very moved by her testimony regarding her experience in Michigan State. I've been at Michigan State, but uh, also have similar experience in my graduate uh, studies in urban planning. And actually, that's what made me become my historian, because I had a professor, because I was a student activist, that said uh, I should go play basketball. And I said, we're on the court and I'm going to slam dunk you. Uh, luckily, I've been studying the African-American and African history of my own. And with the little knowledge that I had, I was able to defend myself and graduate. Uh, but my question uh, for the, Dean Perry has to do with the access to professional school. Uh, there's certain um, requirement that's extremely antiquated like uh, requirements for, you know, some, I know they're facing some of it out now, like GRE and all the stuff, but MCAT for medical school and some of these requirements doesn't, a lot of the students spend a lot of years just trying to pass the requirement to go into school. And while in other countries in the world, uh, once you have a prerequisite degree to go into the professional school, you are admitted. And sometimes uh, veterinary medicine, medicine, they go in from second, they go from high school. So uh, I wanted to know what the barriers are, what kind of things, because uh, I never thought I could get a master's degree, but, or a PhD for that matter, but there's some interesting things that, cannot be measured, which like persistent and determination. So I was trying to know what, how you take into this kind of two attributes into your decision making when you're admitting veterinary students. Okay, uh, thank you, Salal. Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. And we I get that one all the time in terms of, so veterinary medicine uh, is an extremely competitive profession. And so we're looking at students who can, who are strong in math and science in the STEM. Unfortunately, it, because when they get to that first year, our attrition rate now is, is almost 10%. And we try to get that down to uh, 1%. Uh, to zero, actually, we try to get it down to zero. We don't want to lose any student. But when they come in and they are not very good test takers, they're gonna they're gonna uh, struggle. If they come in and don't have a really strong background in math and science, they're gonna struggle. And so, therefore, we put in measures such that or or um, uh, factors where they can actually uh, do well in and and gauge their performance in the program. So those milestones we have to put in place, those academic factors that need to be put in place. For example, we know students of color are not good standardized test takers. Well, if we know that, that's data driven, why don't we prepare them to be uh, good test takers on standardized exam? Because that's what the licensing exam is. And we're struggling there now also. So we have to realize what the data is saying and put in place those measures to help our students be successful. Thank you. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Ms. Karen, 
you turn on your video and come on. Hello and good evening. Um, my question goes to all the women pa panelists today. Um, as women, what are your biggest obstacles you've had to face not only in life, but as well as in your career? Okay, I, I'm not going first this time. No, anybody, in, 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 we, we, we take it in any order. We take it in any order. Who wants okay. to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, when I graduated from college, I was 21 years old. And um, entering into the profession of nursing. And when I, and I, my first job was in the hospital setting, the acute care setting. And um, I was on a, a unit that was um, with patients who were um, heart attack patients. So they were like, it was like a step down unit from the intensive care area. And um, male patients first, I was too young to be a nurse. So um, they really didn't want me taking care of them. And then um, second, I was young and African-American. So they they had a problem with, with both of those. So I ended up having to, sometimes the, um, the managers would have to say, um, we this is the nurse that's assigned to this set of um, patients and she's got to start your IV. So I, I did a lot of um, who being myself initially. And then when I, um, after five years and that's with about, about six years in, in, um, in that setting, when I went to um, academia, I was actually in a in a in a setting where I was the only African American instructor, and um, I really had to myself because every semester I had to teach a totally different course, and then after being switched around like that for about three years. Then um, and I, I I I did what I had to do, and um, I was approached by one of my colleagues who said to me, um, "You passed the test," and I said, "Pass what test?" She said, "Every semester we switched you, and made you teach something different. We thought that you would quit, but you didn't." Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next, any other response? Dr. Perry, Dr. Glotova? Well, let me just add to my uh, colleague, Dr. Sh uh, Shannon, uh, is that one of the challenges uh, that I had that I had to sort of figure, I had to figure it out is when you're married, you know, you want to have a supportive spouse and then having children and uh, ensuring that women get the same support in their, their leadership role and their academic uh, professional success uh, is having a supportive spouse. Uh, the, there's I, well, I'm not, I, my husband is also a veterinarian. We don't compete and that's key. We do not compete. Uh, he does what he does. Ruby Perry does what she does. Uh, but in my space as a female leader, I, I'm in charge there. When he's in his space, he, he's in charge. So we have a, a understanding, but it comes again with those conversations and willing to, to adjust and uh, compromise uh, and so that that is just one barrier 
and especially when you having the children, because typically women have to responsible for the ch children. But nowadays, men are taking that role as well because it's changing these generations. So that that is that was one. It wasn't a barrier. It was um, just a hurdle that I had to adjust to with with a spouse and both of us being professionals. All right, thank you, Dr. Perry. Dr. Glotova, any insight? Um, yes, I would like to follow on uh, both of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shannon and Dr. Perry. So when Dr. Shannon uh, shared her experience as an instructor, I thought about my way um, working here at Tuskegee University. And I do have some challenges from my colleagues, but more challenges from students. Because the question always, can you do that? I teach activity classes swimming, track, volleyball, tennis. And my students always ask me, can you do that? And yes, I have to stay in very good shape to actually swim and play tennis or, or demonstrate volleyball or run a mile with my students. So students, they challenge me a lot. And thank you students uh, for that because I still healthy. I have a job with benefits. Uh, to follow up with uh, Dr. Perry, family is very important and balance um, with your family responsibilities uh, with your um, children is very critical. It's, it's essential. Uh, my husband is also a college professor. He's a math professor at Auburn University. We function in two different uh, universes, physical education and mathematics but we share a lot of similarities when it comes to teaching, research, service, working with colleagues, working with students. We try not to overwhelm each other with our issues or challenges, something that is going on currently, um, but we also try to um, provide enough time for our, our children, although they are one is adult, one is a, a teenager. We still cannot check out. We still have to be present in their life. So balance your professional life and your personal life. And if you have a spouse who is very supportive, even though you don't play piano, I don't play piano and my husband loves music, we still share a lot of common things. Thank you very much. I see a few hands raised and I would plead that we keep the questions brief and also the answers brief because very soon it will be two hours that we've been on this call. And I know it is dinner time. We love to continue the conversation, but let's keep it brief. And the people I'm calling who sense I see up is Jamie Barcliffe, Makaya Coleman, Amaya Richardson, and Anthony Mohammed. So this will be the last four questions and we'll go in this order. Ms. Barcliffe, you have the floor, ask your question. Um, I believe my video is on. Yes. Uh, Okay, well, uh, first off, good afternoon. My name is Jamie Barcliffe. I'm a freshman electrical engineering major. And before I ask my question real quick, I just wanna say thank you to the deans uh, for coming here today to speak with us. You all have said a lot of really interesting things, uh, things that even I have thought about and opinions that I have. So I agree with many of the things you guys have said. Uh, but one thing I specifically wanted to ask was to Dean Perry. Um, you spoke in your first question about one big issue that you, feel is pressing in your area and is more funding for students, uh, I guess, to have better resources for them. So uh, you all as educators can continue uh, to grow and foster our learning while at Tuskegee. How do you feel that we as students can also advocate for ourselves in that aspect? Because one thing that I feel like is a very important um, thing that we as students need is more funding and resources. Um, here because not only do I want my education experience at Tuskegee to be uh, more amazing than it already has been, but I want the future uh, students at Tuskegee to get better as well. 
And so, well, thank you for that. And I'm gonna, I'm going to pronounce your first name again. And it's Jamie. Yes, ma'am. It's Jamie. Okay. So I have a student leadership council, and I believe, I truly believe in students working with leaders to come up with the best and well-informed decision, especially because it impacts the students. I don't want to make a decision and the students in a um in a well in a at a worse place than where they were before because I didn't get a chance to ask the person who's going to be impacted by the decision not be a part of the discussion. And so could there could we have could we do better with communications on this campus? Absolutely. Is an opportunity for students and leaders or in your faculty get together and just have a conversation back in the day and I and we can still we can bring this back. We used to have more activities where students could give us their opinions on something. You all have you all are bright minds and have you like I said in my my uh, statement is you all see things we don't see. You all have different perspectives that we don't think of. The, the the not the problem, but what we should do is try to find a platform where we can get together and just have an open discussion. We're not blaming, it's not a blame game. It's how can we better serve the university and the students together? All it takes is a platform for, for a discussion. That's where it starts. And it doesn't take just one, it's ongoing. And we have to be willing to hear what we don't want to hear. Nobody wants to hear bad news. But if you're going to make change, you got to hear it. You got you got to hear it and you go, oh, well, I thought I was doing better. I thought I was doing great in that area. No, you're not. And I have to be willing to hear that as well uh, as a leader because you want to make it better. So the answer to that is we need some type of platform where there's ongoing conversations. The more you know, the better you can, can make change. The more you know, the better you communicate, the more you communicate. And so I, I so we just need to find those spaces where there's conversations going on everywhere. And then we filter those conversations upward to the administration. I'm sure they would like to know also. What are the students, how do the students really feel? And sometimes it's not always in a survey. It's not always in a survey. How about let's just hear you? So anyway, I'll stop right there and let my <laughs> let my colleagues say All thank right. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any insight from Dr. Glotovo, Dr. Shannon, before we take the next question? Well, I'll just say that one of the things, um, Dr. Doc Perry, you just did a gave us confirmation also. One of the things that um, we used to do and with COVID, we stopped doing it. And now we know that we really do need it again is we uh, we have town hall meetings uh, with each of the, we have, we always have like four cohorts. So um, we, um, we, we're gonna reinstitute that so that we can, you know, and they have that platform so that they can tell us what they want us to to know about their experience and what they need. Thank you. All right. Dr. Glotova, any insight or we go to the next question? I just want to thank uh, um, Jamie for that question, for her comment and the question. And I agree that the platform where students' voices can be heard is very important. And guys, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to speak up. We always love to hear from students. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Indy, okay. if I could just, just echo Dr. Glotova. I don't know if, if uh, I, you know, my question to students is why, if I give you my cell phone number and I say, call me, why is it that I hear, oh, well, we, I didn't want to bother you, Dean Perry, because you're busy. I, I, you know, that again, that's Jamie, that's part of the conversation with if I'm telling you, you can reach me or you can contact me. I don't understand why students don't take advantage of that. Uh, because at an HBCU, you can touch 
your leaders. You can really touch your faculty and staff where you might, where you're not, you may not be able to do that at other colleges and universities. So, but anyway, I think students need to, to find their voice to say, don't don't just write, put it in a letter and say, well, we 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 don't we we just heard how do we just come to the to the D's and say, could we have a conversation? You, you would be surprised that they'd be like, oh, absolutely. But anyway, if you can share that message with the other students, that would be just great. Thank you. Miss Coleman. Hi everyone, my name is Makaya Coleman. I am a sophomore animal science major and business administration minor. And as leaders, it is common for everyone to either agree or not agree with you and your views on certain topics or issues. So I was wondering, how do you handle criticism or negative feedback within your uh, leadership position? Thank you. And thank you for being here. I appreciate your guys' time. Any of our team good... team, deans, please <laughs> take the floor. Okay, that that's that that's a good one. And uh as leaders, as leaders, we don't have all the answers and we don't get it right the first time. Uh and I'm who, who am I talking to? Because I like to call students uh, by Makaya name. Coleman. Mak Hello. Makaya. Yeah, yes. Oh, Micaiah. Okay, there you are. Okay. So, uh, Micaiah, we as leaders don't do not have all the answers. And we and uh, we don't get it right the first time. We may not get it right the second time. But before we make these decisions, we get we want to get well-informed decisions. And I hear back, but oh my gosh, I di didn't do that one right. But as a leader, we've got to be courageous to accept the good and the bad. As Dr. Uh, I think Lotova said, the good, the bad, and the indifference. Who said that? One of you all said that. No, Dr. Shannon, did you Shannon. say that one? <laughs> Dr. Shannon, the good, the ugly, and the indifference. And so sometimes we get the feedback from our faculty, staff, and students, and it's, it's not correct uh, many times. And sometimes... It is correct. And then we have to swallow that pill and go, okay, I got to make some changes in my own self. Mm -hmm. I, we have our own limitations. We're, we're human just like you all, just like the students. We, we, we in pain like you all. They're nice, but we're up all night. You all are studying, trying to reach a goal. We are studying and writing, trying to keep the college together. So I see it exactly the same. So we 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 spend uh, sleepless nights just like you all. We're stressed just like you all. We can't sleep just like you all. We need health and wellness and well being just like you all. So we just want to let you all know that we're human too, and and when we accept that, well, not accept it, but when we hear it, we have to be willing to accept it and make a difference to get it corrected. So yes, that's part of our training to do so. Thank you so much for that question. That one we struggle with. <laughs> yes, that was a very good question. Thank you, Makaya. And um, I concur, Dr. Furry. Uh, we are not perfect. We don't know all of the answers. Sometimes it takes us time and time, a lot of brainstorming to find a solution. And sometimes that solution is not the best and you have to find another solution. So it's not plan A, B, it's probably the whole alphabet, but you need to remember, it's nothing personal. It's a workplace. It's your job. It's your profession. It's your um, wise decision. So it's about, yes, it's about your character, but it is, it is not something personal. So don't take it too close to your heart, because if you do at some point, it will burn you. You will struggle it will lower your self-confidence. So it is not personal and every problem has a solution. So you will find a solution as a future leader. You will learn from your own mistake. You will find a solution with help from your colleagues 
and you will do great. Thank you. Dr. Shannon, any insight to Makaya or we go to the next question? I think they I think they covered it. All right, thank you. Miss Richard Sinamaya, you have the floor. Okay, hey, hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Amaya and I'm an environmental science major. And my question was just for all the panelists and it was just as uh, like women in leadership positions and roles, what do y'all feel are y'all's like unique strengths and perspectives or experiences that y'all can share not only with like your students but also with faculty? And like, what do you think is the importance of y'all having those positions and like being able to share that information and inspire other women? I'll go first. Okay. Well, one of the one of one thing is that um as as a leader, um, there are times when you you really need to be transparent and share experiences because that helps to strengthen and build the person that you're sharing that experience with. Um, when you are in leadership for a while, you'll know who to share with, when to share it, and how to share it. And um the the experiences that we have they are they are actually ingrained within us so um we 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 can we hold them on the inside and when it's appropriate to share then then that's what we do because we know that um one of our one important role for us is to make our students stronger um we want you to have the tools that you need so that sometimes you don't have to go through what we went through we can talk about a shared experience. And uh, when you come to a stop sign, rather than um, speed through, you can, um, you'll know whether to turn right or to turn left based on just the, um, what we have shared with you. So um, we, we learn and um, those experiences that we know will, will help, will help, the, help our students and our colleagues then, um, then we share them accordingly. I hope that helps. Thank you. Dean Perry, Dean Glotova. Well, okay. Well, if Dr. Uh, oh, if you want to go, uh, Dr. Glotova? Go ahead, Dr. Perry. Uh, okay. So uh, persistence and being able to adapt because each day is different. I, I said, if God continues to give me health and strength, if I didn't get something done today, oh, I'm going to try, try to fix it on Monday. Or if I didn't, if I didn't do a good job today, I'm going to try to do better on Monday. It's a, I'm just inspired by that. So if, if, uh, if, if, if again, if I have the health and strength that continues, I'm going to be persistent until I get that thing completed. Uh, and sometimes it take years. So you got to have some patience with it as well. So when things are thrown in your path, you, you, you've got to be able to stand brave and courageous and persist. If it's meant for you, it's, it's going to happen, but you got to work hard, you know, hard, hard for it. So yes, adapt, resilience and, pers and uh, persistence. Thank you. And I would just uh, add one more perseverance. So be determined. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have one hand up. That's Dr. Anthony Mohammed. After his questions, I will simply request you take about 30 seconds to a minute and give us the last word so that you can go and eat dinner for those who are breaking fast they go and break fast dr anthony mohammed you have the floor unmute yourself you are muted uh you know thank you dr india i don't have a question but i have a short statement you mentioned food so i know folks are ready to get out of here look 
What a great presentation that we held today. I want to thank you, first of all, Dr. Indy, uh, for putting it on. And thank these leaders, man, these uh, great women, for their recorded history. Uh, key terms that I heard today, and thank, thanks for the, uh, uh, the folks that are, that are tuned in as well. I heard resilience, persever uh, perseverance, persistent, adapt, reaction, uh, don't be reactionary, and solutions and shared experience. These are some important messages that uh, these, these leaders and deans are, are putting together th uh, this afternoon. So I want to thank uh, these leaders for their service to our community, students and university. I say thank you very much uh, for your, your service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, thank you. And dear esteemed deans, I would just request any last words for our audience. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Yes, it, it's, it, I, I will continue to serve I, I didn't think that I could uh, make this panel, but I made it a point uh, to do so. Dr. Indy, thank you for asking me uh, to be on it. Whatever I can can be um, a joy or an inspiration to anybody, not just students, but anybody, I'd, I'm right there uh, to do that because God has blessed me and what's how I can inspire others, I continue to do so. And that's part of my pur purpose. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for the words that you just said. And I, I do appreciate that. And we're just here to serve our beloved Tuskegee University. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank all of the students uh, who were on call today. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for your questions. Very good questions. Thank you for that. And thank you for your patience. So sometimes we talk a lot because we want to share. We want you to know us. So thank you very much, everyone. Dr. Andy, very good event. All right. Thank you very, very much. I just, you have given your last word, but I want to give you a big thank you because this would not have been possible without you. And I want to thank the audience too. It would not have been possible without them. So I thank you. And as I promised, this is just the first of a series. We have to honor our women, our iconic deans. We have to do that. It should, we, we shouldn't only wait for the month of March to do it, if we can do it monthly, because it should be a reminder to us all that women make our world go round. Thank you very much. And I would ask those who are still on the call, send your hearts and your claps to our esteemed deans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Dr. Ndi. Thank, Thank you, Abby Love Deans. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Yeah. Bye bye. Nice <laughs> <That's right. laughs>